Hi, happy Earth Day. Lovely to see everyone. I'm Ashley Swartz, Dean of the Faculty here at Beat University. Uh, this is our third class of the semester. Unknown how many classes are gonna be in this semester, unfortunately, we're still in that sort of unknown area. Um, but thank you for tuning in, everybody that's watching it live and then everybody that comes back and watches them after the fact on demand. We're grateful to have you. I've gotten some really good feedback and I encourage it to keep coming. Um, it makes it a richer experience for me, so I'm deeply grateful. Uh, the shared goal of Beat and Furious is that, you know, it's really to be a lighthouse in this period of darkness. And so just refreshing and providing education and information, particularly to those young folks in our industry that are homebound right now, um, and even the Titans that have been, you know, sort of around the block for a while and maybe just need a refresher and some new jargon, uh, we're hopeful this is valuable. So today's an auspicious day, um, and it's not only Earth Day, but it's also a new moon. It's a new moon in Taurus. I'm a Taurus, so this is significant for me. And in the spirit of being a lighthouse, I wanted to take this moment to sort of Talk about something a little bit deeper before I get into the lexicon of television and video advertising. Um, I wanted to start today and reflect on what a new moon means, right? So the new moon is the beginning of a lunar cycle. It's when the earth, the sun, and the moon are all in alignment, right? It happens as well during a full moon. And the new moon typically means something different. Um, it provides us often an opportunity to reset. And it's really about nourishing uncertainty and finding comfort in the unknown. That's typically what we do in our rituals, kind of, kind of to set an attention going forward during a new moon. Um, so you have this opportunity, specifically tonight at 10.25 p.m. Eastern, to do that, to set intentions. Um, what do you desire? What do you want to manifest? What do you want to affirm? For what are you grateful most? So make it matter. Um, and I, I am encouraging you today uh, in my spirit, you know, my intention to be a lighthouse and a cheerleader, but also, you know, to provide that light and that beacon is to do it in a sober, sober, somber way and with a little bit of sobriety, right? So I encourage you to commit to being your own lighthouse as that's been a lot of the theme and we are, we're trying to make that kind of the purpose of shared across our industry. Um, but if you watch this, you're probably in media. And we as an industry, particularly the media industry, need to take responsibility for a lot of where we are right now as a nation, particularly our current state of well-being and health um, and the psyche of our country and us as people. So, you know, we've created a lot of noise. And as Bill Mayer, I believe, said last night on his show that um, he aptly called it, we're living in a world of panic porn right now. That really is the, the dominant voice and tone um, and delivery of the media that we consume, particularly about, about this virus and this reset. Um, and so I think at some point today, I think it would be really meaningful and a great thing for all of us to agree to grab a notebook. Um, and if you want to be mystical and shit like I am, you can grab some sage and a candle and some crystals too. Uh, and make this moment matter, however long this moment may last, right? And what is behind us is behind us. Um, so I'm not talking about learning Spanish or getting abs, of which I'm trying to do a little both during this period. I'm talking about, you know, agreeing that we all want, there's an awakening that's forced upon us. And we have this choice right now during this awakening. Do we want to end it woken or broken? That's our choice. And I suggest to you that if you make an, a conscious effort and you consciously set intentions um, and establish what you want to be and who you want to be and, and what a lighthouse means to you, I believe that we'll all come out better and hopefully woken and not broken. So listen for the signal and the noise, um, you know, and also just listen more, listen to hear um, and to understand. There may be people that need help that are afraid to ask, whether it's your neighbors or your friends that may need help or a meal or some food, or there may be people at home struggling and are victims of abuse now. Um, you, our peers have lost their jobs. There's a lot of signal that we should be listening for that has been really hard to hear um, in the midst of this sort of reset. And I just encourage you to maybe listen a little harder than you normally would. So thanks for letting me always have a platform. I'm very grateful. Hopefully it's a value exchange because uh, now I'm going to get into our sessions. So class number three, right, which is every Wednesday at 1 p.m. here live and then on demand thereafter. Uh, as everybody, just a refresher, you know, what we're using for the syllabus of this training series is a dictionary that Furious produced a little while ago, which is basically the sort of TV and video advertising dictionary, right? You can find it at the website on your screen now. Um, Andy, I believe, has sent it out as well with the newsletters of the videos um, and has it available 
for download, but it's an interactive dictionary. dictionary. It's chunked into different themes and sections, and we're pulling out those sections one by one for each class. So today we'll go through four of the sections within the dictionary. It's good to have side by side, and the purpose of us creating it is so you can bookmark the dictionary or keep it by your desk in the future in case you ever need it. And just as a function of doing the first two classes, we've got some great feedback, and folks have uh, suggested additions to the dictionary, which we will refresh online and make sure it's available, and it's continually more expansive. Um, so today for class three, the sections in the dictionary that we're going to review are currencies of measurement and sale, digital standards, ad targeting, and the ad tech stack. And again, just to sort of set the aperture that the focus of this is really not just generally media, but it's really specifically television and video advertising. That is the focus of this course of this semester. So we're going to tune in on those areas, um, particularly in that that sort of spectrum, if you will. So let's start with currencies. This is something we talk a lot about where we've been, you know, today and tomorrow, right? And currencies are not just with what we transact, they actually enable sales. And that's very important when we look at currencies of where we are in enrollment time, because it's really about enabling the future and the trajectory or direction of our industry more and more towards audience. So about a decade ago, the gross rating point was sort of still the king, right? Which is uh, ultimately a currency that, you know, originated in television and with radio. But the buy side isn't happy with that. And, you know, they're not satisfied enough with that anymore necessarily, right? Because it, it tells about tells reach, but it doesn't really help buyers, particularly um, e-commerce, online uh, brands and marketers to be able to measure how every dollar spent in media the, the value it is delivering or the ROI it provides them, right? And so we've come up with a bunch of different ways to do that um, and to sort of try and get at that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. One of the first ones is what we call attribution modeling. And so it's an increasingly common practice of data-driven buyers to ask you know, their agencies and sellers to help them estimate by giving them data back to put into a model how much credit should be assigned to TV or other touch points for sales and conversions, right? To what are financial performance metrics to be able to tie media spend back to that in lieu of looking at reach and frequency as performance indicators, um, sort of, you know, of media, which is a standard metric that's used to determine the success of a campaign. So attribution modeling is great, but it's still a dark art, right? Every um, buyer's attribution model is a little bit different. Television is very different from digital. And then if you try and do cross-platform, do you have a unified attribution model? And ultimately, you know, the methodology and the calculation and, all, and how it's done is not necessarily shared openly and transparently with sellers. So it's really challenging for sellers to be measured on our, an ROI metric that they have no really understanding, visibility, or transparency to. And then ultimately, they have no voice Voice in affecting or just determining. So there's a lot of sort of push and pull there. Um, Audience-based metrics, right? Based buying metrics. So this is the way that TV has traditionally been bought and sold. It's really about optimizing for reach. So reaching as many of a specific broad defined audience uh, target group as possible. Typically those are standard defined segments that are used by Nielsen. Uh, automated content recognition is a very interesting area. It's also called ACR, right? So that is technology that reads pixels or an audio signal um, on a smart internet connected device and then screens, right? So it's used to identify content and ads that people are watching, right? So um, this is an interesting uh, mechanic. And so it's really important to understand that connected televisions, they now have an operating system. So you watch TV through a connected TV that typically comes in through your HDMI single, uh, your HDMI um, input rather, but ultimately, there is an operating system and, you know, that sits within that television that you all know you can switch to. Right. And so that operating system, that software can listen. That is automatic content recognition, the listening to what is being distributed through that other HDMI cables or other input devices to see what's happening. So initially, when ACR became popular, we were talking about interactive television. It was Jennifer Aniston's friend, you know, uh, uh, sweater from Friends, right? Let's overlay an interactive display ad on the TV and try and sell something from that show. But ever increasingly, ACR has become a mechanic to try and measure actual exposure for television, right? So it's this sort of black box that can listen to what's actually being seen and to measure and monitor exposure on television. But it requires an opt-in by consumers. So consumers have to say, it's okay to listen. And let's be honest, going back to, you know, when Intel was trying to launch the first real virtual MVPD called OnQ, 
that's creepy and people still find it creepy. So increasingly, I think that there's more and more receptivity um, and people are allow, allowing devices to watch and monitor and listen to their behavior, if you will. But ultimately, it's about a value exchange. I'm not sure that that's been figured out by the smart TV manufacturers. So C3 and C7 are uh, metrics that were launched by Nielsen to measure the average viewership of commercial time within TV shows, right? So what happened initially with the onset of video on demand and DVRs or what we call time shifted viewing, um, particularly when we started blocking the ability to fast forward through ads on a lot of devices, um, we saw ever increasingly more and more particularly episodic programming um, in prime time was watched time shifted. And so Nielsen created this mechanic where we could sort of spread because, you know, an eyeball that watches on the second day after it runs on 10 o'clock the night before just because they had to get their kids to school early shouldn't be any less valuable to an advertiser, right? It's still part of the target audience. It's still adjacent to the same content. So it created these windows of sort of three and seven days after the first live linear broadcast to measure the cumulative audience watch, uh, that watches during that period, right? So at Ad Age recently reported that C3 ratings have dropped precipitously um, as millennials more and more are just abandoning ad supported television programming overall. So as more and more viewing is shifting to SVOD, as we particularly see now, because Netflix numbers are off the chain, they're even higher than expected with COVID right now, which is a uh, subscription supported VOD and not ad supported. I think ever increasingly more that construct of time shifted viewing and a window of value is diminishing. Comscore is the sort of second uh, big dog in, in, the, in the measurement game, right? So they're a major, major measurement provider that is really Nielsen's biggest competitor. Um, and they have the roots in dig digital. And both Nielsen and Comscore are sort of going after the same jump ball, which is to own and be the leader for cross-platform measurement. Neither one of them really cracked the nut. Uh, there's no sort of dominant player that owns this space. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is also later. But ultimately, Comscore is the second uh, dog in the race, if you will. Cost per completed view. So we're going to talk a little about performance metrics and particularly around digital. So cost per completed view is uh, a bidding method where advertisers pay each time an ad is watched in its com to completion. So the entirety of the ad from start to finish, a 10, a 15 second ad, et cetera. Um, so it was established in digital and it's aspirational in television, right? Um, because we don't know if somebody's walked away from a, a television to get a cup of water or, you know, to refill their, their beverage. Um, so ultimately that's very hard. But, the, you know, this years ago, at and uh, sorry, ABC rather, um, when they were led by Jerry Wang, I think made this very commonplace in television, particularly through authenticated and over the top experiences where she started selling video ads using this mechanic and saw her her effective CPM rates jump for that platform to more than like $50. So we see that there's an incredible opportunity to increase the value of the inventory when you shift to a performance-based metric. But the problem is you have to then balance your portfolio because you're still probably going to have to sell some of that inventory on a reach basis, which is more of a CPM basis in digital. So that's a cost per thousand impressions, right? So per campaign, it's calculated by dividing the total cost um, uh, by the total number of impressions and then multiplying that by a thousand. And I think CPM is actually what's going to be the sort of lowest common denominator that drives cross-platform and audience-based buying increasingly more and more because although television is particularly local still sell a spot-driven business, you know, they're still looking at impressions and they sell various products like Interconnect using impressions. So I think impressions, given that that's the dominant currency in digital has been and continues to be and is a conversation with which we can speak to and equivalize in TV, that will probably win ultimately cost per point or per campaign it's calculated by dividing the total cost by the number of grps so this is just something really in television but particularly local because quite often local television at the local broadcast level in particular is really share driven right so you're looking at a total audience in a market and what that value is and then how much of that share of that market are you capturing so cost per point is sort of something that is much more common in local television for example than in national broadcast a cost per view is a bidding method where advertisers pay uh, for each time an ad is viewed. So the ad doesn't necessarily need to be completed. It just needs to be seen above the fold, delivered, and viewed. Um, there are probably some business rules around it. But, you know, video ads on YouTube, Facebook, a lot of the social channels are often bought this way. Cross-platform measurement is the ability to measure reach, frequency, 
impressions and other data points across platforms where a video campaign was delivered, right? So cross-platform really gets to the fact that video viewing, particularly with younger audiences, is increasingly more across multiple devices. So it's not just television and connected TV, it's de it's mobile, um, it's desktop as well, and it's obviously tablets. So progress has been made, but technical limitations and privacy concerns still make it really, really hard, right? And we're gonna get into a little bit more about this construct of a duplicated reach and UIDs and how that makes it even harder. So the signal to noise ratio for cross-platform measurement is really, really high. Uh, a demo impression guarantee is a guarantee from the seller that a campaign must hit a certain number of impressions within a target demographic for the price paid, right? So this is really about just guaranteeing what you sold or is delivered, where typically you make a buy in digital and then at the end comes out how much was served and you only pay for what you bought. And if there's a variance of more than 10% as a general rule in the US, then um, you know basically what ends up happening is the buyer eats that. So you know this idea of sort of just paying for what you use in digital is really commonplace, but it's not that simple in television. Um, frequency, is something we talk about a lot in TV. And ultimately that's, and in digital as well, and the construct of frequency capping, right? So the number of times a viewer sees an ad during a fixed period of time. So frequency capping is a restriction imposed by advertisers on the number of times an ad can be shown to ensure that impressions aren't wasted. Because there is something called overexposure. So a great example was when I watched the Olympics, that would be two years ago now, the Summer Olympics on NBC and their authenticated app, I would see a Coke commercial in each ad pod, which was typically, I think like six ads, literally three of the six times. And there's some point of diminishing brand value and return there um, when you're that oh, continued overexposure, right? So the GRP, the big daddy of measurement. So this is the dominant traditional metric for TV advertising, right? It's about impact. So GRPs are tallied by multiplying the percentage of the target market reached by exposure frequency. Um, so for example, if you advertise like 25% of the market uh, and you gave them three exposures, you know, you would have 75 GRPs, right? So it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's not super sexy, not super high math, but it's still how most of the television is transacted today. Impressions then ultimately are the total number of ad views during a campaign. So I think you guys know that. Impressions are eyeballs one to one, right? Nielsen is the dominant, still big dog provider of TV measurement for the entire history of the medium. So um, it's, it's their monopoly, um, even though they've broken themselves up to uh, sort of different entities, you know, still they are for television, they are the dominant um, party and, and they're competing now with Comscore for digital. And then ultimately I think digital being a jump ball means that cross-platform will continue to be. Reach is the number of different people or households exposed to an ad during its run at least once. So we say how far the ad reaches across an audience or an install base of platforms or devices, for example. The spot rate in television is just a simple flat rate that you pay for an ad. It's not tied to any type of measurement. It's just, you know, when this ad runs at this ad break during this hour on this program on this network, it's yours. Or, you know, you're simply buying a number of spots during a day part that is, you know, uh, served at the discretion of the scheduler at the TV seller. But ultimately, it's about a single price for a spot. It's not based on any measurement currency. Let's get into digital standards a little bit. So I... Uh, this is something that I know enough about to be dangerous, just that I know that it's really important, uh, but my team is a lot smarter than I am in this area. But really, you know, the trouble is that with digital and television in particular, but even one of the things that has held digital back and really holds over the top back is this sort of lack of standards for delivery and measurement of online video. Um, we know that this, the measurement is a challenge. We just talked about that in currencies, but just sort of standards, technical standards in particular, as all of these um, platforms, when you look at sort of within, whether it's an iOS or it's an Android or a Roku device, or it's a Samsung, or it's a Sony, or it's a Vizio uh, OEM platform, you know, there are different technical standards, right? And so that means a number of product variants and testing and sort of video, video delivery requirements, all those things which make it really complicated to deliver video and even harder to insert ads into that video and then make sure the user experience is not compromised and the viewing experience is seamless and we can measure it and all of those things, right? That's that's a lot of magic that has to happen. Um, so the IEB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, has been a great entity within our industry that has helped a lot of this. They've imposed and created a lot of the standards, and it is a constant work in process still. It's evolving. So sort of as a throwback, you know, the video ad serving template um, was the spec originally introduced by the IEB in 2008, and it helps sort of standardize communication requirements between ad servers and video players. So ad servers are inserting ads into videos during predefined breaks that are 
they're playing within ad players. So there's a lot of talky talky as my head of product is sort of uh, and, and dear friend says, uh, JT White, I love this, right? These systems have to talky talky to work and it's really hard because they're talking, they're speaking a different language because they do different things. So the intent was to protect publishers from having to continually update their video stack in order to receive ads from, from various servers, um, which use a wide range of communication protocols. So there was this constant sort of chasing of the tail of having to update standards and inter inoperability. And, you know, you would try and serve an ad to a video player, but it wouldn't work with this one, but would work on this one. You know, if the ad was served, what often was happening is, is particularly in premium video or over the top, we had this issue for a long time where the first ad in the pod was always missed. And it was just never served because the ad servers couldn't move fast enough. Um, and that was for sort of different reasons. But that's a great example of when technologies aren't seamlessly, seamlessly integrated with standards and protocols. What happens? The, ultimately, the viewer is the one that suffers. So VPAID was sort of the V2.0, right? So this was stood for video player ad serving interface definition. And this really was not just about inserting sort of video ads, but it was about also interactive ads and rich media units, right? It was about being able to, for example, when you're, you know, you have a pre-roll on a YouTube video and you're able to click on something to buy or click to learn more, you make it more dynamic, et cetera. Um, so it was mainly used for measurement and verification, but it became totally overloaded. And then ultimately it didn't work anymore. Right. Um, and what we see now is that that is being phased out with something called SIMID, which stands for Secure Interactive Media Interface Definition. So that's a spec to support interactive video ads. It was released in 2019. Um, but the reason this is important and we sort of need to displace uh, VPAID was because ultimately VPAID was really desktop driven as well. So we have so much video now being consumed on mobile and that's a completely different technical environment um, with different players and things like that and, and interface protocols. So ultimately we had to upgrade as well, not just to handle more types of ad formats, but to be also going to handle more platforms and more devices. So let's get into ad targeting. Right. So now we're talking about the evolution. What does all this technology and this data enable? Well, it allows us to actually know to one identify who's watching a piece of content, particularly television or video, and then to reach them with an um, ad that matters with resonance. Right. Um, and so though advertisers still view TV as a medium with unmatched reach, new technologies have sort of, you know, offered increasingly sophisticated targeting um, so that, again, fish with a net for television versus fish with a nine when you're using a line when you're using, for example, first party data to reach an individual. The metaphor in television is always like the dog owner that gets the dog food ad, or as I say, the yogurt eating mom in Duluth that's in the market for a minivan and a household with more than $100,000 income. So you go from fishing with a net of, you know, a million plus viewers to when you take it down to that level, you got five moms in Duluth that actually are in the market for your minivan. So uh, it, it's challenging, right? It's a balance. Um, and so we're really trying to figure it out. And ultimately, we're trying to figure out how to measure the exposure to the content of the ads in the context of the viewing behavior that's spread across multiple devices in particular. So this unduplicated reach is still the holy grail that no one's cracked the nut on. This idea of understanding that I am sitting in my desktop, I'm going to move to my iMac, tonight I'll be on the couch, you know, and probably have my smart TV on and watching an app while my phone is in my lap. And then in the mornings when I get up and I sit in my coffee, I have my tablet in front of me. So being able to follow me and deliver an ad to those devices and know that that I'm on what device at what time is still something that we haven't figured out. Um, deterministic modeling is uh, sort of one of the things we talk a lot about ad targeting, right? So a methodology for mapping devices to audience segments that prioritizes accuracy, usually by leveraging logged in or known user data. So this is really about using PII, um, determining who is viewing, who's on the other side of that screen, and then targeting them. So it uses names, IP addresses, emails, phone numbers, um, often held by first parties, and content distributors, and then a third party sort of objectively often uses uh, data to uh, help spy blind matching it and then potentially bringing in third party data to bring custom segments from those combined first party data sets. So it's this continually overlapping then. And this is really important, right? Because this has gotten ever more increasingly challenging, particularly with GDPR leading the way out of Europe and now in the US states replicating that standard. Um, for example, with CCPA in California, right? That's the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, so, you know, people's pro personally identified information PII is ever increasingly more protected and we are moving more and more towards a world of no cookies and a, you know this cookie-less world what does that mean uh, and where people have to opt in in order to receive targeted ads so although deterministic is something we talk about a lot it's it is 
you know, it's something we keep chasing and it's becoming more and more challenging to actually, you know, have confidence that it's going to be an actionable lever in our toolkit in the future, particularly around television um, and video advertising. Probabilistic modeling is something slightly different, right? That's a method methodology of mapping devices to audience segments or content to um, programming to audience segments. So it sort of often relies on consumer panels assembled by Nielsen, et cetera. Or, you know, we can ultimately build, um, we can do probabilistic modeling by looking at programming, et cetera, and sort of create index, right? So ultimately, you know, television is still measured on a probabilistic way. It's census driven. Um, we use statistical modeling and predictive algorithms to try and determine the makeup of of an audience and the total reach of an audience. Um, you know, when we were doing this, and then ultimately what's happening is we know we're using indices or index space to, to look at programming or content. We're specifically selling ads to say that there is a high probability this content will index higher to reach this audience, right? Yogurt eating moms, loving dog owners. Um, and so again, it's, there's no guarantees, there's no measurability, there's no reconciliation. It is an exchange of trust in many ways in that measurement. Um, a device graph is a method of attribution that attempts to link an individual to all the devices they use. What I was talking about before it's, I have a personal device graph, a, a an individual has a personal device graph, right? And so ultimately this enables advertisers to view behavior holistically instead of counting each device as a separate person. So understanding how I move throughout to my 24 hours in a day from each device. And then for example, to be able to sequence ads based on time of day, the activity that I'm engaging in, you know, perhaps my mood, um, the cycle of the moon, whatever it may be to deliver me the right ad at the right time so that it resonates and it has relevance. Um, what's really interesting about the device graph particularly, and then ultimately uh, with unique identifiers, which I want to, let me put that defin definition first, is that unique identifiers or UIDs are assigned to devices that enable ad targeting. Um, and so that's all only to get to an identity on a person, right? So we have this thing of proliferation of walled gardens right now. So that's guys like Xander, Google, Facebook, right? Ultimately, um, it's really the, the digital sort of players are the dominant voices there, but you have legacy players that have made heavy digital investments and are building out, you know, robust ad tech stacks to build their own UID, a set of UIDs and their device graphs. So the problem for an advertiser on the buy side, and this is where, this is the rub, right? Is that I may, I'm going to try and aggregate as enough audience by having as many devices and platforms, et cetera. So I can build a very, very large, wide reaching device graph. And I will have my own UIDs with which I can build custom segmentation models for you. And I can use to match to your first party data as an advertiser. That's my value proposition as a walled garden. But I'm not sharing that with anybody else. So Google and Facebook are not sharing. Xander and Google are probably not going to share, et cetera. So that just makes more friction for, um, for buyers, right? It makes it harder because they can't collectively buy across all the media outlets that they spend their money and have a sense of confidence that they are minimizing duplication of reach. And they're ultimately, you know, a person that flows between Facebook and, you know, and, and Google, for example, knowing that there's a level of intelligence with which their ads are showing up on those various walled gardens per se. So not everybody's playing nice together. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit more when we get into the DMP which is part of the next section. So we're going to talk about the ad tech stack now. This is our last section. This is my favorite part. Uh, I like technology um, and I like infrastructure diagrams and things like that. So I get very excited here. But uh, I think a little bit of throwback to history is, uh, you know, in 1941, that was when the first television ad ran. The first digital ad server was founded in 1995, right? That is 54 years. And it wasn't double click. It was a company called Phonolink. Um, but, you know, as television becomes more digital, as they say, platforms and tools that feel familiar like digital and the programmatic ad tech stack are sort of going to move into the lexicon of television. But let's be clear, the future of television is not the digitization or the digitalization of television. It's not just bringing a bunch of tech that works for, the, you know, the web and mobile to television. This is legacy. We talked about this in our first session with the broadcast 
um, and, and sort of cable and television, um, you know, sort of legacy in the industry and how much there was fixed infrastructure and fixed hardware. And with the first TV ad running in 1941, you know, the systems that deliver television ads, a lot of them have been around for a very long time. And so it's really important to understand that because you can't just rip out and replace television infrastructure. It doesn't work like that. Um, it's not, it would not be a prudent capital decision or a prudent decision for any seller to do, but ultimately it's just not easy and it's a recipe for failure. Um, so square peg, round hole, digital tech, television business, no, no talkie talkie. They're not simpatico. We have to reimagine digital technology in the context of television in order to solve TV's problems today and help TV scale and grow. So let's talk about what those, that tech is. So in digital, there's an ad server, right? It's a web-based tool that enables the management display and tracking of ads on digital properties, right? So this is that what delivers the right ad at the right time. It can use data, et cetera. Um, and so ad servers also collect and report on data so that advertisers can monitor campaign performance. And then they also do the reconciliation. And quite often, for example, a buyer or an agency can log into an ad server and they can provide a tag so they can track how that ad is served, right? A tag is sort of a digital pixel or something that sits on top of a piece of creative that they could actually see and confirm that it was delivered and monitor it and actually track the performance and the fulfillment on their, on their buys. Um, a billing system uh, in television in particular is a system of record uh, for what actually ran. So in TV, this is really important because the buyers don't have visibility into the systems that deliver the creative assets or deliver the campaigns and fill them like you do, for example, in digital. So what comes out the back end, there needs to be some type of reporting and reconciliation. And the billing system is sort of the arbiter of truth to ensure that the uh, buyer is billed for what was actually filled and delivered. Right. This is really important. It's a connection with the trafficking system and the integration is very, very deep and intertwined within a legacy TV seller. A data management platform, which I was speaking to before, is a software system used by marketers and agencies to house and manage various types of customer information. So a data management um, platform, for example, uh, particularly like at an agency or, or at a buyer would sort of be the hub and smoke bottle. So they would have a DMP that would allow them to take their custom segments or their sort of unique, you know, their sort of unique IDs or whatever, um, you know, customer graph they have built and then match that to individual log gardens, for example, to be able to buy and actually target and deliver ads against their segments they built with their DMP and the data matching that occurs within there. Um, you know, again, what you don't have is the deduplication and the inability to dedupe across these walled gardens is not a significant potential loss of value, economic value in particular, when you have marketers that spend billions of dollars a year on advertising. Um, examples of DMPs, for example, include Lodomy, Salesforce has a DMP, Oracle has a DMP. So these are big dogs. So DMPs are ever increasingly more a significantly important part of a um, advertiser's enterprise. An order management system or an OMS is a tool that helps buyers and sellers track and manage linear TV contracts and orders. And there's also sort of digital insertion orders as well. So they exist in both the linear and the digital uh, sales workflows, right? So separate OM systems are normally used for linear and digital. And that's because the role of the order management system differs. So in linear, typically what you have in order management systems role, systems role is to actually take orders and then sort of queue orders up for the purpose of scheduling and then ultimately insertion by a trafficking system. So you have this exercise within a, and we'll talk about more next week, we're going to do linear sales workflows, but you know, the scheduling of linear ads, because all the trafficking system does is deliver the ad that is scheduled and it's told to at a specific time to fill a specific spot. And you know, it's quite often simply rate rules driven if then, or, and then often also priority code or inventory code driven. So there's different statuses of an inventory types within linear trafficking systems and that combined logic or simply an if greater than statement on the price for the spot will determine what actually gets trafficked. But there's always that manual intervention for priority or high value inventory, which is the most labor intensive part of linear tra sort of sales workflows, FYI. Um, in digital, it's a little bit different. The order management system is actually doing a little bit more work, right? They're establishing and integrates with the CRM. It establishes sort of, you know, a likelihood of close, if you will. It holds and reserves inventory. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, there's a flow through at the end that sort of you can close and reconcile, you know, orders versus what would fill, what that's reconciliation, and then sort of continually optimize ideally. Um, there's the mediation layer in ad servers. So they're more slightly more intelligent. It's not just a waterfall digital ad serving sequence 
as it was in the beginning, but they've evolved to much more complicated uh, decisioning and ad servers are just slightly quite often more robust in their ad decisioning versus a trafficking system. Um, so we have proposal systems, right? So that's a little bit more up funnel. Um, and ultimately they help create, store and manage RFP responses. So final proposals that will in turn become orders. So they sit ahead of the order management system. And proposal systems are becoming increasingly more important. They're, I mean, quite often proposal systems are just Excel worksheets and linear, but as more and more audience uh, sort of, you know, inventory is sold on an audience basis for both linear and then obviously digital, particularly when we're trying to combine both the buying and the selling of audiences across, multi, across digital and linear platforms, proposal systems become more and more necessary to be able to sort of do that with ease and confidence. A traffic system, as I started to speak to earlier, is a tool that ingests orders from an OMS in a linear sort of sales uh, operational workflow. And it's used to schedule and deliver campaigns on air, right? Um, and it could also be across sort of digital platforms. But it's, again, the, the logic and the decisioning is quite often not as evolved as a digital ad server is particular. And it's really just often doing what it's told. A yield optimization system is a platform that often sits atop of these vertical silos of linear, of digital, of programmatic um, to basically help automate sales planning and pricing workflows and then ultimately help allocate inventory and price it more effectively to make sure that all of these different systems together are delivering the maximum revenue at the lowest cost for a seller which is very complicated is typically, you know, today, again, these businesses are managed as separate lines of business or profit and loss statements with Excel. And so, you know, you need connected tissue because those systems do not come together or integrate or talky talky. So something has to tie that all together, right? Um, and in a cross sort of platform audience based buying world that becomes ever increasingly more complicated and the wheels fall off the bus is if Excel is your only tool with which to run your business when you're selling yogurt eating moms in certain markets um, across every device that you have with a specific frequency cap, for example. So, you know, we're going to talk a lot more um, about the sales workflow. And I think I'm going to unpack architecture given the time that we've gone into today. But ultimately, you know, the one size fits all this idea of a combining digital and linear and mobile and every device ad servers and every type of sales channel and having one integrated converged system like that's a unicorn that lives in the lands of like pixies and fairy dust and, you know, rainbows. So it, it's not going to happen. And it's not really it's, it just makes sense for it to happen either way from an enterprise management and enterprise sort of efficiency perspective. So ultimately, we just need to continue to work these systems more, uh, more efficiently together because they will continue to exist in parallel in these silos. So that's it for class three. Thank you. Thank you for always giving me a platform. Go download the dictionary or desk, um, you know, bookmark it on your desktop and your browser. I welcome your input, your feedback. Next week is class four. Crazy. Uh, we're going to talk about TV systems and workflows jobs and roles and functions in TV buying and selling. And then we'll talk about the future of TV advertising as well from a definitions and a very sort of academic perspective. Um, I encourage you to write down your intentions, to make a list of the things for which you're grateful. And I open my heart to you. And if you ever have any ideas or suggestions or just want to riff, reach out to me. You have my email. So light to all, love to all, peace to all. I wish you a great new moon and a great new lunar cycle. And I wish everybody happiness and peace at this time. Thanks.